The 1984 McDonald's All-American team doesn't have many NBA stars, but several players carved out solid careers in college and the pros. That said, there are a few players who, for whatever reason, didn't make the cut in 84. The list of players who didn't make the squad includes one-time All-Star from the Netherlands Rick Smits, six-time All-Star Mitch Richmond, one-time All-Star Hersey Hawkins, three-time All-Star Thunder Dan Marley, and one-time All-Star Anthony Mason, among others. With all that said, let's take a look at what happened to every McDonald's All-American player from the 1984 squad. Matt Bussert. First, apologies if I've mispronounced that, I couldn't find any footage of an announcer saying it. B started his career at Notre Dame, but found minutes tough to come by during his first two years at the school. To be fair to the 6'6 forward, there were two future pros in his position on that team in Donald Royal and Tim Kempton, but Bees would transfer back home to Cal ahead of the 86 season. After sitting out a year, he became an everyday starter for the Bears, averaging around 12 points and 6 boards during his two years with the team. Bees went undrafted but spent 10 years playing in Europe, winning 6 titles across several leagues. Since hanging him up, Bees has become a coach, running several youth camps and private instruction clinics in California. Delray Brooks Brooks joined Indiana to play for head coach Bobby Knight, expecting to be one of the first players off the bench during his first few seasons. Unfortunately, he didn't quite fit in with Knight's game plan, and Brooks quickly became frustrated at his lack of playing time. Eleven games into his sophomore season, Brooks left the team and transferred to Providence to play under Rick Pitino. He had to sit out for the spring, but he could start playing in the fall of 86. Brooks quickly showed why he was so highly regarded in high school, immediately becoming a double-digit score for the Friars. Teaming with Billy Donovan, Brooks led Providence to the 87 Final Four where they lost to Syracuse, which was marred by a bench-clearing brawl. Brooks went undrafted in 88 and played a few seasons in the World Basketball League before joining Patino's staff at Kentucky in 92. Ever since then, he's been coaching in college and high school. As of 2024, he was working at the head coach of Clay High School in Indiana. Michael Brown Brown came from the hollowed halls of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a D1 basketball factory in the 80s. Playing alongside future pros Muggsy Bogues, Reggie Lewis, Reggie Williams, and David Wingate prepped Brown to be a stud player at Syracuse. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. Brown's first season was solid. He started nearly every game and dropped over 8 points a night for a top 15 team, making the all-freshman squad. However, his minutes plummeted as a sophomore as coach Jim Beheim decided to go with the taller Howard Tree his position. Because of that, Brown decided to transfer to Clemson midway through the season. During his lone year with the Tigers, Brown averaged a hair under 9 points a night while coming off the bench for much of the season. I haven't been able to find out what he's been up to in the years since, so please share in the comments if you know. Derek Chivas From the jump, Chivas was a scoring machine at Missouri. The 6-7 forward dropped 13 points a night as a freshman, and that ballooned to 24 and 23 as a junior and senior respectively. Band-Aid also contributed more than 8 points and 1 steal a night, making him one of the Tigers' most valuable players. When he left school, he was the team's all-time leading scorer. At first, it looked like that college success might translate to the NBA. Band-Aid was picked 16th overall by the Rockets in 88 and managed 9 points and 3 boards as a rookie. However, he was traded to the Cavs midway through his second season where playing time at his position was much tougher to come by. Instead, Chiefs would head to the CBA and then overseas where he became a Greek League All-Star in 1994. Since then, he's mostly stayed out of the public eye, though his son Quinton did play at Tennessee and Hampton during the mid-2010s. Edward Davender Davender was a star on the street courts growing up and continued to play well for his high school team. He would head to Kentucky to play college ball, joining a team that featured five other McDonald's All-Americans, including one player we'll get to shortly. By his sophomore season, Davender was scoring in double digits while contributing solid assists and steals numbers. While he was overshadowed by Kenny Walker and Rex Chapman, Davender was usually the Wildcats' second option and a key cog in the team's success, making two All-SEC teams for his efforts. Davender was selected with the 60th pick in the 88 draft, but did not play in the NBA. I haven't found much about what he did for the next 20 years, but in 2010 he was convicted of a ticket scam and sentenced to 8 years in prison. After getting out of parole, he was working for the Lexington Parks and Rec Department. Sadly, Davender passed away in 2016 after a heart attack. Dwayne Farrell Farrell played high school ball for Calvert Hall College, which won the high school national title in 1982. He then joined a loaded Georgia Tech team that featured Mark Price, John Sally, and several other future pros. During his freshman season, he was named the All-ACC Rookie of the Year, though he served in a more complimentary role to the team's stars. By the time he was a junior, he led the team in scoring at 18 a night. He'd increased that number to nearly 19 along with almost 7 boards and make the All-ACC team twice before graduating. Somewhat surprisingly, the 6-7 guard then went undrafted in 88 but signed with the Hawks. Paco played there for six seasons before spending time with the Pacers and Warriors. He'd retire after the 99 season and subsequently work with the Hawks and Wizards organizations. I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think Paco is related to Yogi Ferrell, despite Yogi's middle name also being Dwayne. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Gary Grant 
The general joined the Michigan Wolverines and was an instant star. He never averaged below 12 points and 4.7 assists during his four years at the school, and those numbers grew to over 21 points and six assists in his final two seasons. Simply put, Grant was one of the best and most consistent players the Wolverines have ever had and still holds all kinds of records at the school. During his four seasons, he was named the Big Ten Freshman of the Year in 86, Big Ten Player of the Year in 88, and named a two straight All-America teams to end his career. The General was then selected with the 15th pick in the 88 draft by the Supersonics, but was immediately traded to the Clippers. He played there for seven years, scoring double digits during his first two seasons. In fact, he averaged a double-double with 2.5 steals during his second season, but injuries would quickly relegate him to mostly backup duty by his fifth season. Still, Grant carved out a 13-year career across four different teams before spending a year in Greece and retiring after the 2002 season. It looks like he spent some time as an assistant coach at San Diego State in the early 2000s, but I haven't found anything suggesting he's still working as a coach as of 2024. Craig Jackson Jackson joined UCLA to play college ball. The 6'7 forward made the Pac-10 all-freshman team, but only averaged 4 points and 4 assists, mostly coming off the bench. His numbers grew slightly as a sophomore, and he became an everyday starter. I'm not sure if he was injured or just in the doghouse, but his minutes dropped to 11 a game as a junior, and he only started 7 games. As a senior, he was back in the starting lineup and raised his average to nearly 8 points a night. He went undrafted in 88 and has seemingly disappeared from the public eye, so if you know more, share it below. Cedric Jenkins Jenkins isn't listed on some rosters, but I found a page from an old Hoops magazine that listed him be on the team, so I'll include him here even if he might have not actually played in the game. The 6'9 center went to Kentucky for his college career and played as a backup for basically his entire career. He finished his career with averages of 2.5 points and 2.4 rebounds a night while playing in 110 games for the Wildcats. Swoop did have at least one memorable moment as a senior. He had worked his way back into the starting lineup, and with Kentucky down one against Louisville, the big man tipped in a game-winning shot to save the top-ranked team from an upset. He wasn't drafted, but he did play in several leagues overseas before retiring and working in several different fields. Unfortunately, Jenkins passed away in 2023. Shelton Jones Jones kept it local and went to St. John's. During his first season, he was used sparingly, but as a sophomore, he became an everyday starter. The Amityville Horror grew into a stud, averaging 19 points and 9 boards as a senior. For those efforts, he was named the All-Big East team and was selected with the 27th pick by the Spurs in the 88 draft. Jones only played one NBA season, but played for three different teams during that single year. Plus, Jones participated in that year's dunk contest, finishing fourth behind Spud Webb, Clyde Drexler, and Kenny Walker. He then spent several years in the CBA and playing overseas, making the Italian League All-Star Team in 93 and winning the CBA's MVP in 96. After retiring from the sport in 2004, Jones opened up his own foundation to mentor student athletes where he's still working as of 2024. Andrew Lang Lang stayed local and played his college ball at Arkansas, first under Eddie Sutton and then Nolan Richardson. To start his career, the 6'11 big came off the bench to back up Joe Klein, but in year two, he became an everyday starter. While never the scorer Klein was for the Razorbacks, Lang did average around eight points and seven boards as a starter. More importantly, he contributed more than 2.5 blocks a night as a team's rim protector. He was then selected with the 28th pick in the 88 draft by the Suns. Lang continued to be an effective shot blocker in the NBA, but never developed into a big scoring threat. The journeyman center played four seasons in Phoenix before being traded to Philly in the Charles Barkley trade. In total, he'd carve out a 12-year NBA career across seven different teams. After the 2000 season, Lang retired and he has been working for the Hawks as the team's chaplain as of 2024. Both of his sons also played college basketball, one at UMass and the other for Belmont and Lipscomb. Derek Lewis Lewis was born in North Carolina, but played his high school ball at Archbishop Carroll in Washington, D.C. He would then attend Maryland for college ball, joining a team that featured Lim Bias, Adrian Branch, and Keith Gatlin. Despite that star-studded lineup, Lewis started nearly every game of his freshman season, posting 6 points, 6.5 boards, and 2.7 blocks a night. Those numbers would only grow as he became an upperclassman, though his best season came as a junior when he averaged nearly 20 points, 10 boards, and a ludicrous 4.4 blocks a night. He finished his career as a two-time All-ACC nod and one-time All-American. Lewis was selected with the 62nd pick in the 88 draft by the Bulls, but never played in the NBA. Instead, he'd spend the next decade-plus playing overseas, mostly in France. During that time, he won the French Cup once, made the All-Star team twice, and led the league in blocks five times. Lewis also recorded the league's first quadruple double when he dropped 20 points, 11 boards, 12 assists, and 10 blocks during a game in 1990. After hanging him up, Lewis started a basketball camp and had become a teacher. Troy Lewis Lewis took his prodigious talent to Purdue, where it was immediately clear that he would become a star at the college level. 
As a freshman, he was the team's third leading scorer with 10.4 points a night, despite coming off the bench for much of that season. In year two, he was made the starter and obliged with 18 points a game. That number would stay right around there, and Lewis was the team's go-to scorer during his final three years while also giving the Boilermakers three assists and four boards. He was named to back-to-back -to -back All Big Ten teams and made honorable mention All-American in 88. However, a lack of elite athleticism and he went undrafted in 88. He played for a few seasons in the CBA before retiring from the game. Lewis wrote and directed a short film called Blacklight Dream in 2018 and currently works as an assistant coach for a high school in Ohio where he helped the team win back-to-back -back state titles in 2022 and 2023. Al Lorenzen. Lorenzen stayed in state to play for the Iowa Hawkeyes. During his first season, he got solid playing time, but mostly came off the bench to average six points and four boards. The next season, the 6'8 forward became a starter and averaged 10 points and five boards. However, he lost his starting spot as a junior and his numbers tanked. He'd work his way back into the starting lineup as a senior and averaged 11 points and six boards, though he only played in 20 games that year. Lorenzen went undrafted, but he eventually made his way into the broadcasting and business world where he still works as of 2024. His daughter Haley played four years of college ball for the Florida Gators, but decided against trying to make it in the WNBA. Richard Madison. Big things were expected from Master Blaster when he stepped onto the Kentucky campus. During his first two seasons, Madison came off the bench and averaged around five points and three boards. He was made a starter as a junior and averaged nine points and seven boards, but that move was largely made because Winston Bennett was rehabbing a knee injury. With Bennett back, Master Blaster was again moved to the bench, and he responded with a disappointing three points and three boards a night to finish out a lackluster career. Since finishing his time at UK, Madison has seemingly faded out of the public eye. Danny Manning Manning's father, Ed, played in the NBA and ABA in the 70s and then became a coach at the college and pro level under Larry Brown. So it was not a huge surprise when the 6'10 power forward became a top player in his high school class. Ed had gotten a job at Kansas under Brown in 1983, so it was almost a given that Danny would play for the Jayhawks. Fortunately for KU, Manning was a force at the college level. Over his four-year career, D averaged 20 points, 8 boards, 1.7 steals, and 1.4 blocks a night. He was named the Big 8 Player of the Year for three seasons straight while also making three three straight All-America teams. His best season came as a junior when he averaged 25 points a night to win the National College Player of the Year award and lead the Jayhawks to the NCAA championship game where he dropped 31 points, 18 boards, 5 steals, and 2 blocks to win the underdog team a title. For those efforts, he was selected first overall by the Clippers in the 88 draft. During his rookie season, Manning tore his ACL and only played in 26 games. He came back and played very well when healthy. By 92, he was averaging over 20 points a night and made two straight All-Star teams. However, he was then traded to Atlanta for Dominique Wilkins. Another major injury to his other knee essentially forced him into a reserve role by 94, but Manning remained productive when he got on the court. In 98, he won six man of the year while playing with the Suns, but after that, his career started to wind down. Manning retired after the 2003 season, carving out a solid 15-year NBA career despite all the injury troubles. Since then, he's entered the coaching world, working as a head coach for Tulsa, Wake Forest, and Maryland, but as of 2024, he's working as an assistant at Colorado. Roger McClendon McClendon went to Cincinnati for college ball and was an instant starter for the Bearcats. In fact, most would probably argue that he was the team's best player during his four-year career as a 6'4 guard averaging nearly 16 points and four boards during his time with the school. For that, he picked up two All-Metro first-team selections and became the school's second leading scorer all-time behind Oscar Robinson. While always a threat to score, McClendon didn't seem to care too much about playing basketball at the pro level. Instead, he got his degree in engineering and took a job at Yum Brands, where he would eventually help create the role of Chief Sustainability Officer in 2010. As of 2024, he's working as the Executive Director of the Green Sports Alliance, which promotes sustainability through sports. Craig McMillan McMillan joined Lute Olsen's Arizona Wildcats to play college ball. As a freshman, he mostly came off the bench to spell starting guards Steve Kerr and Morgan Taylor. When Taylor graduated, McMillan entered the starting lineup and responded with 12 points and 4 assists a night. McMillan would start every game during his final three years with Arizona, but was overshadowed by future pros like Sean Elliott and Tom Tolbert. That said, he did average 9 points and 3 assists for his career, making McMillan a solid third or fourth option for the Wildcats, especially during their run to the 88 Final Four. He never played pro ball, instead taking a job as an assistant coach at Marquette in 89. After a few seasons as an assistant at Tennessee, he'd coach overseas for a few years before taking over as the head coach at Santa Rosa Junior College. As of 2024, it looks like he's still there, though his bio on the site seemingly hasn't been updated since 2015. Either way, he's been very successful with HRJC over his long career with the school. David Rivers Rivers played high school ball under legendary Jersey City coach Bob Hurley. He would then play his college ball under another famous coach, Digger Phelps, at Notre Dame. From the jump, Rivers was a starter, averaging 16 points and 4 assists as a freshman. 
He led the team in scoring all four years of his career, finishing with 22 points a night during his senior season. That was made all the more remarkable in 86 when he and Ken Barlow were involved in a car wreck that left Rivers with a life-threatening cut on his stomach. After finishing his career with the Irish, Rivers was selected with the 25th pick in the 88 draft by the Lakers. He played there for a season and then spent a few years with the Clippers, but largely made his career overseas and in the CBA. Before retiring after the 2004 season, Rivers won the 97 Euro League, 98 Italian Cup, the Greek League twice, the French League once, the Turkish League once, the CBA title once, and picked up a host of MVP trophies along the way. After retiring, he spent some time coaching, most notably at Kennesaw State from 2014 to 2015. Most recently, he was living in Switzerland directing basketball camps. Chris Sandel Sandel started his career at Arizona State, where he averaged right around 13 points a night over two seasons. However, he decided to transfer to UTEP in the middle of the 86 season. Reports from the time claim that he was offered money and a car to transfer to UNLV, though Sandel and the UNLV coaches deny that happened. Either way, Sandel didn't stay with the Blue Devils, taking his talents to El Paso. There, his numbers increased until he was averaging 17 points and 6 boards a night for the Miners. Sandel was named to the All-WAC team twice, but wasn't drafted. I haven't been able to track down much about his post-collegiate career, but sadly he passed away in 2010. Charles Smith Smith was an instant star at Pitt. The 6'10 forward won Big East Rookie of the Year, averaging 15 points, 8 boards, and 2.2 blocks a night. Those numbers only went up as he made four straight All-Big East teams. During his senior season, Mr. Fluid dropped 19, 8, and 3 en route to winning Big East Player of the Year and making the All-America team. Smith was then selected third overall by the Sixers in the 88 draft, but was immediately traded to the Clippers. He was shining in LA, making the All-Rookie team and then averaging more than 20 points a night in his second and third seasons. However, knee injuries hobbled him in 92 and he was traded to the Knicks. A power forward by trade, he was moved to small forward in New York and struggled to find his groove. Plus, more injuries kept him from getting back to the promise he showed at the start of his career. Smith did play for nine years across three teams, but those knees kept him from fully living up to the hype. After retiring in 97, he entered the business world while also working with the MBPA to help support fellow retired players. John Thompson The MVP of the 84 McDonald's All-American game started his career at NC State. Thompson came off the bench to spell Lorenzo Charles, but only mustered two points in five minutes a night. As a sophomore, Thompson only suited up for four games before transferring to VCU. His junior season saw him playing a little better, but he'd finally have a full season as a starter at 87-88, averaging 10.5 points and eight boards a night. I've been unable to find out anything about his post-collegiate career. As always, if you know more, share it in the comments. Kevin Walls Walls came from the 80s basketball factory that is Camden High. He averaged nearly 45 points a night during his senior year, seemingly a sign of things to come. Coming off the bench, Walls helped fellow Camden alumni Milt Wagner and Billy Thompson win a title for Louisville in 1986. The next season, he started several games before lashing out about the team struggles in the paper. Following that, coach Danny Crum benched the former star for several games. Crum would finally call on him again in a game against South Carolina, but Walls refused to take the court and quit the team. It doesn't look like Walls played the game again at the collegiate or pro level and fell out of the public eye for the most part. That said, it seems his son Vinny also played at Camden before spending some time at the D3 level. Chris Washburn Washburn was one of the top players in his class and signed with NC State for college alongside future pros Vinny Del Negro and Nate McMillan. During his freshman season, Washburn was caught stealing a stereo. He spent two years in jail and during his trial, it was discovered that his SAT scores were too low to play for the school. With his eligibility problems, Washburn only played seven games as a freshman and his work ethic was also often questioned. However, he played every game of his sophomore season, averaging 18 points and seven boards a night. For that, he was named the All-ACC team. Washburn decided to head to the NBA after the season, and in retrospect, his poor grades may have played a major part in coach Jim Valvano ending his career in 1990. Washburn was selected with the third pick in the 86 draft by the Warriors. He was mostly ineffective as a rookie and was traded to Atlanta in 88. During that time, he checked in a rehab for a cocaine addiction. He missed the 88-89 season in rehab, and Washburn was permanently banned from the NBA the next season for substance abuse. Washburn then struggled with his addiction for several years, going to rehab 14 times. He was also homeless for a time and went to prison. Fortunately, he was able to get clean by 2002, and he's been working to help others overcome their addictions. Two of his sons played at the D1 level, and Julian would eventually make to the NBA with the Grizzlies in 2019 for 18 games. Julian currently plays for the Austin Spurs, while Chris Washburn Jr. plays overseas. John Williams Williams left Crenshaw to play in the Bayou when he signed with LSU. The hefty big man was a double-digit scorer in both of his collegiate seasons, averaging 18 points and 8.5 boards a night as a sophomore. Instead of continuing to dominate for the Tigers, Williams went to the NBA in 1986. The Bullets made him the 12th pick, and he averaged 9 points and 5 boards coming off the bench. 
He continued to play well for Washington, even being a contender for six men of the year in 89 and 90. However, his weight continued to balloon, and Hot Plate Williams missed the entire 91-92 season as he was suspended without pay until he got his weight under control. To be fair to Williams, he was dealing with several deaths in the family and the pressure of supporting his mother, grandfather, and several children from a previous marriage. In 93, he played with the Clippers, mostly off the bench. Hot Plate then wrapped up his career with one more year in LA and a final season in Indiana. He would then play overseas until 2002. I've been unable to find anything about what he's up to nowadays, so feel free to share it in the comments if you have further info.